morning. Am I on? All right. <clears throat> I'm always thankful for Mike and the team to be able to fill in and when I, when I get a chance to come up and, and share God's word this morning. So I uh, just want to thank them for leading us in worship again this week. I like to switch things up because, you know, just kind of do something different. And so I always enjoy coming up and, and preaching and sharing God's word with you. Let's, let's go before the Lord and just uh, for a moment, all right? Lord, we just quiet our hearts before you this morning. We ask that you would teach us to pray. We ask that you would teach us to hear your voice as you speak, as I speak, Lord, as we look at your word this morning, that you would be speaking to our hearts truly and deeply, and that we would leave here different than when we came. Lord, help us to know how much you love us, Lord, this morning. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, you just watched that video, so you know that we've been in a series uh, called Basic. And we're asking the question, what are the basic things that are involved in the life of, G- of, of the life with God? Our life with God. We've, over the past few weeks, we've been talking about um, the word restored. That's an important word for us to, to think about in terms of what God is trying to, where God is trying to lead us for the future, we had our night of vision a couple of weeks ago called Wholeness 13, that God is restoring us. Last week, if you remember, there were four priorities in the life of, of the Christian, of the person who follows Jesus, uh, that, we, that we need to think about and integrate into our, our uh, life. The communion, the communication, the connections, and compassion. See, they're all C words, so you can remember them easily. Um, But we're going to look at that first priority today, communion. In communion, we're asking the question, what does it look like to commune with God? To back off that sort of religious lingo, what does it look like to be a spiritual person? What does it look like for a, a Christian to live out their spirituality? Okay? In a larger sense, everyone lives a life with God. God exists. I exist. There must be some relationship between us. What is it? What does it look like? What does it mean to be a spiritual person? How is my spirituality expressed in my life? Okay? Of course, there's many different uh, ideas out there in the world about that. You only have to go to a Barnes and Noble and look through the spirituality section, and you can see a wide variety of different ideas about spirituality and what it what it means to live spiritually. Um, some people would say they're not spiritual at all. Maybe you're in that boat this morning. You know, maybe you, you're you're just visiting in church, but you'd say, you know, I'm generally not a spiritual person. Uh, you know, generally speaking. Uh, But I would say everyone is spiritual. Everyone is spiritual. And I'll talk about what that means in just a minute, why I think that. Um, But how we see our spirituality is usually based on what we think about God and how we perceive our relationship with him. What does God really have to do with us? What does he want for us? or from us, right? There's so many ways we can see uh, our spirituality. As a basic definition, I want to put up on the screen for you. This is a definition that I think anybody, whether you're a Christian or not, would agree with this definition. You can be a Buddhist, you can be an, I don't know about an atheist, but you can be all kind of different religious background or not religious at all, and maybe agree with this Uh, definition, and it's this. Spirituality is encountering the transcendent and being changed by it. Encountering the transcendent and being changed by it. I think that's a good place for us to start as we begin thinking about what it means to be spiritual as a Christian. Something transcendent, something bigger than ourselves. Like I said, that, that takes a lot of forms, but for a lot of people... 
their spirituality might be defined in terms of getting involved in something bigger than themselves, like a charity, like volunteering at a homeless shelter. I know a, uh, Pastor Kevin was talking about a, a gay couple that he knew that volunteered every year at a, at a shelter to give food to the homeless. And that was sort of their form of, of, of giving back to the world, of being involved in something bigger than themselves. There's a, um, a sort of well-known European environmentalist. I want to put up a quote from her that's interesting on here. She says this. She says, I'm not religious in a conventional way, but there is a strong spiritual dimension to my life. Isn't that interesting? That seems kind of contradictory to how we might think. But a lot of people, that's their spirituality, that they're a part of something bigger than themselves. They may not call it God. They may not call it Jesus or Allah or Buddha or whatever, but they're a part of something bigger, and that's how they define their spirituality. Activism in the world for many people. And we might agree with that to an extent, but does that really define spirituality? Most of us would know that it wouldn't. Well, what about us? We, we do this as well. We can base our spirituality on doing stuff around here for God, for Jesus, right? And we need people to do stuff around here, right? The kids aren't going to watch themselves. The offering plates aren't going to pass themselves. Who's going to put the donuts and coffee out on the table out there? Who's going to lead small groups? Who's going to teach Sunday school? Who's going to put together the communion elements? On? We have Jane. Jane's for that, right? <laughs> but, um, but these are important things, right? These are things that we need to do. But what happens a lot of times is we can base our spiritual life around doing these things, right? And we say, surely God likes the fact that I'm doing these things. We even probably get a, a good feeling from doing these things as well. And we think, oh, God must surely be pleased with me as I'm doing these things. We can find our connection with God through these things. Of course, there's, there's sort of a pitfall with that, too, is that when we don't do these things, or there are periods of our life where we're not doing these things, we can have this sense of guilt uh, that we're not pleasing God, you know, or we're not living up to God's expectations of us, right? We think, oh, God, I, I know I need to get more involved in church. I need to do this and that. I need to pray more. I need to read my Bible more. But I'm just so overwhelmed. I'm so busy. I'm just so whatever, you know. And, and, and we can sort of feel real guilty about that because we think God is not pleased with that. Um, this is a big issue. Because I think a lot of us go through life thinking that God is generally not happy with how we're doing. We might think that he loves us, however we understand that or, or maybe misunderstand that. But we generally think God's not very happy with us, right? My daughter, the other a couple weeks ago, my youngest daughter, Mackenzie, she was having a real rough day one, one day, and she was acting up and misbehaving, and I was really kind of coming down on her a lot, you know, correcting her, disciplining her. And after the end of the day, she, at one point, she just got kind of frustrated, and she turned to me and she said, Dad, do you love me or do you like me? And I was kind of taken back by that, you know. I, I kind of felt like, well, this is not an either-or situation, <laughs> Mackenzie. But, you know, and she's kind of a, she's kind of a, has a quirky sense to her. She likes to kind of, um, uh, she, you know, be creative in, in her words and stuff. And she was kind of playing with me. But I also got this sense that she was disconnecting these things about that I love her and I like her, you know. That somehow I could love her but not like her. You ever see that in parents, you know, they, they would tell you, I love my kids, but when you watch them and you interact, it looks like they don't like them very much, right? Um, we do that with God. We do that a lot with God. I think we walk around thinking that God loves us. He's supposed to love us, right? That's kind of his job, but he doesn't really like us that much. He's not really happy with how we're doing in life. I think a lot of us walk around like that. But if we base our spirituality on this sort of expectation that I'm not living up to God's standard or I'm not doing the things that I think he 
he would want me to do or whatever. If that's my spirituality, what about those parts of my life where I'm not doing those things? Those, those parts that are not so pretty in my life, the parts that I like to hide from other people and from God. How do these things fit into my spirituality, my life with God? See, the Bible tells us that we're made in the image of God. And that means, well, it means a lot of things, but for our purposes this morning, we need to know that being made in God's image, and this is the first thing you can write down in your little note notes there, being made in God's image is that we are hardwired for relationship with God. We're hardwired for relationship with God. God is spirit. We have a spirit. There's a connection there. We're hardwired for it. Right? We are meant to commune with God. Okay? But we want to get back to the question, too, how do we define this relationship with God? We have to define the terms. How does the relationship work? My relationship with my wife is not the same as my relationship with my water guy. At least we hope it's not. I might have to resign as a pastor here. (laughs) But I digress. Anyway, let's move on. Everything I've talked about this morning usually... We revolve, we, we base our spirituality around doing things, right? Doing things. But real Christian spirituality, and this is the point I want to come to, and I would say just the way spirituality was meant to be in real life, but Christian spirituality is just living all of life with God. You can write that down. Living all of life. With God. You can circle or underline that word all. That's an important word in that phrase. All of my life in relationship with God. Even the not so pretty parts. We don't have time to to really get into that area, but even the parts where I'm screwing up, where I'm failing, the parts that I'm ashamed of that I don't want other people to know about and God to know about, certainly. We like to think that we're hiding it from him. But those parts, I'm living my life before God and with God in those parts. That God can redeem those things. I don't don't have time, like I said, to get into all that. But this is what true communion with God is. God did not create us to do a relationship with him. He created us to be in a relationship with him. We're not human doings, we're human beings right? He created us to be an ongoing relationship, all of life. And this can be summed up in one word, communion. Communion this morning. It's a life that's characterized by being an ongoing relationship. This is what it means to be God's image bearer, really, functionally. We're hardwired for this, okay? But of course we know, if you know your Bible, that shortly after God creates all of us and hardwires us, making us in his image to relate to him, we screw things up pretty well. We only get three chapters into the Bible, and we find Adam and Eve screwing things up, messing up their hardwiring, as it were, and, 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 and becoming alienated from God. But of course, God, God always has a plan. God is faithful. And so God takes one man, Abraham, He chooses this man and he makes, he forms a special relationship with him, a covenant, right? The hard wiring is screwed up. Mankind in general is not in a good relationship with man. So God reaches out and takes Abraham and says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And Abraham was called God's friend. That's a rare thing, to be God's friend, right? It's not the way we were intended, but he was because of this covenant. And so we know that God makes a whole people, Israel, from, from Abraham. And these people ultimately end up in a place called Egypt where they become enslaved, and, but God is, is still working with them, is still building a relationship, and he rescues them from Egypt, and he brings them to this land of promise, this land of blessing. 
And as he brings them there, one of God's favorite ways in the Old Testament of expressing his relationship with his people, as he plants them in this vineyard, or in this land, is calling them his precious vineyard. That he is a farmer who has planted this precious vineyard. Look at this verse in Isaiah 27. Verses 2 through 3. The Lord says this, Sing about a fruitful vineyard. I, the Lord, watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night so that no one may harm it. In days to come, Jacob will take root. Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. So you see the scope here? The hard wiring is of our relationship with God is messed up, and so God comes and makes a covenant with Abraham and in Israel. And, but the whole point is that Israel will be a fruitful vineyard that will bless the whole world, right? Fill the whole world with fruit. It's a great picture here we have of God as a farmer who takes great pains to nurture his vineyard so that it will be beautiful and fruitful. But again, if you know your Bible, you know what happens. His people, Israel, they become unfaithful, increasingly unfaithful to the Lord, who has planted them and cared for them and blessed them. Something is wrong, and the vines in his vineyard are no longer producing sweet, delicious fruit. God begins to be grieved over this, and he has to act. There's a disease in his vineyard. And it needs cleansing. Look at this in Isaiah 5, verses 4 through 6. Look what the Lord says here, these strong words. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, and neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. God kind of sounds like a hurt and scorned lover here, doesn't he? Who's been betrayed by his love. Judgment comes upon Israel in the form of these invading nations who take over them. They go back to a bondage, even though they're not in Egypt anymore. They're They're in the land of blessing, but they're back in bondage again, right? And nation after nation comes and oppresses them and rules over them until they get to the point where they're just existing, lifeless, filled with thorns and and weeds under the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire. It looks like God has scrapped his plan to reestablish relationship, doesn't it? But God is faithful, right? God always has a plan. He will yet bring a way to restore relationship. He will establish a new kind of spirituality here. He's going to rewire us in a sense. And how he does that is he sends his son Jesus. He sends his son Jesus. God's precious vineyard that he loves so dearly, this burned and trampled wasteland, hardly with any spiritual vitality at all. And all of a sudden, this strong vine breaks up out of the ground, strong and green. And he begins to speak of God's kingdom coming, God's vineyard that is about to spring up again. God's lifeless and fruitless vineyard is about to find its true source of life and fruitfulness again. Jesus emerges, and he begins to talk about the coming kingdom of God and what it's really all about, this life with God. He makes these striking statements about how we can call God Father. Father. That wasn't heard of at that time. He's beginning to redefine our relationship with God and what it's supposed to look like. And so he takes on to himself this picture that God uses of Old Testament Israel, of a vineyard. And he says this in the final days of his life to his disciples. He says, 
I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch in me that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. See, our life with God is about remaining. It's about living in relationship with Jesus so that God can bear his fruit in our lives, right? Jesus is establishing this new kind of spirituality, a new way to relate to God. This is why we call it the new covenant. That's why it's exactly why we call it the new covenant. It's a new thing God is doing. Instead of us reaching out to God, trying to find, to connect with something bigger than ourselves and find God in our own way, God reached out to us. God not only cares for us as his vineyard, but he plants him very, his very self in the hard and lifeless ground that he would become the true vine. I hope we don't miss this picture here because it's so important. He is the true vine that's going to produce fruit and bring this vineyard back to life. As Jesus begins to speak to each one of us, he calls us to connect ourselves to him, the true vine, so that he can begin to bear fruit in our lives. As we connect, he speaks to us. He calls us. We respond to him. He connects us to himself and begins to speak and work in our lives, pruning us and cleaning us and preparing us so that fruit will begin to emerge in our lives. Most of us this morning are connected to the vine, are connected to Jesus. None of us are perfect in any way, but But God has cleaned us to a point where we can begin to be fruitful. And many of us are this morning. This church bears a lot of fruit, and I'm thankful to be a part of it. But what he's saying here is you have to remain in me. You must abide in me. You must live all of your life with me, communing with me so that I can produce more fruit in your life. Here's your next fill in the blank. The basis of our spirituality is communion with Christ. Communion with Christ. That's what we've been saying the whole time. The result, as we commune with Christ, as we fall deeper and deeper in love, investing our time to to build this relationship with Christ, to get to know his voice, to recognize it in our lives so that he can speak and we can respond to it. The result of this is fruitfulness. 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 Now let's look at this last section real quick. Jesus wants to reiterate two things about this. The consequences about this reality and the blessings. Okay, he says in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He's repeating this himself again. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now here's the warning. Here's the consequence. Jesus is getting real here. Look at this. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. That's a pretty hard statement, right? That can bring us a lot of fear in our minds as we think about that. One of the things that love does, it tells us the truth, right? It tells us the truth about things. 
it warns us. Why does the branch wither? Because it ceases to be connected to the vine. It ceases to take from that which supplies it life, that makes it grow, that makes it fruitful. And when you lose what gives you life, all there is is death. That's a hard statement Jesus is making here. I hope you don't hear what he's not saying, though. He's not saying when we screw up, we're in danger of going to hell. I think what he's speaking about here is this consistent effort to avoid relationship with God, to try to do things on our own, to try to form our own spirituality, our own sense of righteousness or religious life, apart from a relationship with Jesus because of pride or whatever. Hear, don't hear what he's not saying, but take the warning for what it is. Now here's the benefit, because Jesus always wants to end on a redemptive note, on an encouraging note. Look at this in verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. When we're in this continual communion with God, we begin to experience tremendous freedom and blessing, right? We begin to do things and ask God for things, and all of a sudden we see God working in our lives. We see God answering prayer. We see God doing things that we never would have imagined. We half the time barely dare to ask because we don't believe. What a great blessing it is when we can begin to experience this freedom of of God doing these things. Ask whatever you wish. That's another difficult one to get our minds around. But it's in the context of this life of fruitfulness with Christ, right? And in verse 8, he says this here, the last part. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Fruitfulness in our lives reveals God's presence in our lives. It reveals God's glory. People will begin to look at us as we're abiding in Christ and they'll see things that look a lot like God. The blessing of God. The, the goodness of God. The beauty of God in our lives. Right? And that's the proof the Bible says, that Jesus says, that's the proof that you are my disciples. This fruit in your life. Well, what is the fruitfulness of really look like in our lives? This is your last fill in here. What does the fruitfulness really look like? Jesus would go on in, in these verses if we had time to look at them, but he gives it a specific name. And you can write this down. Fruitfulness is a life of love. It's a life of love. God's primary mode of operation, the primary way he functions is out of love. God is sovereign, God is holy, all these things, but his primary disposition is love. And if God is love and the fruit we bear in our lives reflects his glory, it's going to look a lot like love, won't it? Won't it? Remember, we can't make this fruit in our lives. We can't become more loving on our own efforts. Only Christ's presence in us can produce this as we continue to abide in him, right? Fruit emerges when we begin to delight in God, when we begin to be hungry and thirsty for righteousness, when we cannot be satisfied with anything else, when we cultivate a taste for what is good, what is pure, what is beautiful, instead of being destroyed attracted to other things like violence like sexual exploits intrigue savoring the little naughtiness that we might enjoy vicariously through our TV and our movies and the entertainments that we have you know our culture you look at the ads alone most advertisements are designed to appeal to your base nature they're designed to appeal to your sense of lust your sense of greed your sense of pride, it, it all works against the fruit that God wants to bring into your life, which is why it's so crucial that we abide in Christ, that we connect with Christ. Fruit emerges when we begin to allow God to prune us, 
and clean us. Those secret compulsions that we engage in, those destructive habits that we use to self-soothe, to self-medicate because it's just help, it's helped us get through life. God wants to come in and take our splintered branches and bind them up and make them whole again, make them fruitful again. When we begin to understand the depths of our own brokenness and our own sinfulness, as Christ relentlessly loves us and forgives us, all of a sudden we become free to begin to forgive other people. To find it within ourselves, because Christ has put it there, the power and the freedom to forgive others. That Christ brings us to that basic human level, where as, as Henry Nouwen would say, we look at the sins, we look at the weaknesses of our friends and the sins of our enemies and see them within our own heart. God shows that to us. That's grace. Grace brings us to a place where we can do something that we could never do on our own. That's how grace works. And we find freedom to forgive others, those who have caused great pain in our lives. Fruitfulness emerges when we begin to see others not as, we begin to see others not as an ends to my goals. You know what I mean? Not as somebody who can do something for me, but as unique individuals made in God's image, fearfully and wonderfully made. It means we no longer desire to exclude each other, but to find that Christ has drawn us together as branches on his vine, to live in community together. That's what fruitfulness looks like. When we become less critical of each other and more encouraging, when we stop focusing on calling people out on their stuff and start calling forth the best in them, when we stop putting them down but start lifting people up with our words and with our prayers to God, we begin to see them as God sees them, as people who are just struggling like we are. And we can come alongside each other and shoulder each other's burdens in Christ, in love. That's fruitfulness. Do these descriptions kind of bum you out? Because they kind of bum me out. My life doesn't look a lot like these things in a lot of ways. I'm not very lovely, loving. I'm not very, I'm not very um, forgiving. I'm not very inclusive of other people, making room for them in my life. This is something that Christ has to do in me I can't make these things happen. You can't make these things happen. We do this as we abide in Christ. And as we just live with Christ, these fruits naturally begin to come out in our lives. We don't have to try to do these things. We just abide in Christ. There's so many ways I can can illustrate this this idea. So many different stories. But I want to just kind of close with... um, with this story about a woman named Doris. Sometimes fruit looks like courage and love. Listen to this. An elderly woman named Doris had parked in her usual spot close to her church in Berkeley. And she was reaching in back inside her car for her basket of oatmeal muffins she was taking into the church. As she leaned in, she was powerfully struck from behind and pushed back into the car and across the console into the passenger side. Breathless, a young man jumped into the driver's seat and took off with Doris riding shotgun. The fact that Doris was in her early 80s and she just had her elegant silver blonde hair done at 11 a.m. on Friday, it didn't matter at that moment. Suddenly, everything had changed. Well, the first thing Doris thought to do was, of course, ask him his name. Like that's the first thing you would think of to do is ask the the person who's mugging you and kidnapping you his name. Well, he told her, he said it was Jesse. So she said, Jesse, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm kidnapping you so we can go, go to your ATM and get money out of your account. Then Doris asked, Jesse, why are you doing this? 
Jesse proceeded to explain to her that he needed the money for drugs. He was addicted and he needed a hit. And after a moment, Doris said, well, Jesse, it's a terrible thing to be a drug addict. You really shouldn't be a drug addict. It's not the way you should be living your life. Hey, if you're going to be kidnapped, at least have an honest conversation, right? (laughs) Well, by then they had arrived at the first ATM machine, and after intimidating her for the password, Jesse jumped out to get the cash. As he sped away to the next branch, Doris continued to explain to Jesse that he really needed help, that this drug problem was much bigger than he was. He needed help from God who really loved him and understood him. Well, after the next branch stop, Doris t- told him that he also needed, to, uh, needed a better program than the one that he had described himself being in before. She said, Jesse, God really wants to help you. Well, by the third bank stop, Jesse had hit the daily withdrawal limit for Doris's account. Since she was no longer useful to him, he pulled the car to the side of the street and explained he was going to leave her there. I got what I need, he said. But Doris was not done. Jesse, I'm going to pray that you get caught for this because it's wrong and you shouldn't get away with doing this to people. I'm also going to pray that you will be caught so that I can not only testify that you did it, but I can plead with the judge to get you into a really good rehab program. You need to get caught so that you can be stopped and be helped. You need God to give you the strength to get off drugs and have a better life. Jesse was just going to leave her there, but Doris couldn't get out of the car because she was so battered and stiff. So Jesse said he would come around to the other side and help her, which Doris really appreciated. He came around and opened the door and helped her out, held her arm so that she could get to the driver's side, and then gave her his arm so she could get into the car. Then he put the seatbelt on her, and he leaned in, and he kissed her on the cheek. In talking with her pastor about this whole ordeal afterwards, she said, it was a horrible thing, but the really horrible thing is Jesse's addiction to drugs. And the pastor responded, well, it's awful that you should get attacked and kidnapped like that. And Doris said, well, well yes, I, I suppose it is, but, but really, why shouldn't this happen to me? This sort of thing happens to thousands of people every day. There's no particular reason it shouldn't happen to me. Let's pray for my getting over this, but let's also pray for Jesse. Well, it wasn't a great surprise within a couple of months that Doris was at the police station identifying Jesse. Soon after that, she sat in the witness box at the courthouse, and she looked at Jesse and she said, Hello, Jesse, remember me? (laughs) Doris, I said I was going to pray for this moment, and I told you why. And here we are. Yes, Judge, Jesse was the one. And uh, he did do all those things. And another thing, Judge, Jesse really needs a good rehab program so that he can get his life back. I know he's guilty, but he really needs help. Please, Judge. Well, I don't know what happened to Jesse after that. But this story, I think, demonstrates how how God can produce fruitfulness in a person's life. When you think about if that had happened to you, I know how I would have reacted. You probably know how you would have reacted. But Doris was so connected to Jesus that these fruits of love began to just naturally come out in her life. It looked like courage to speak truth to Jesse. It looked like compassion. It looked like her concern to act in his best interests over her own. It looked like God, because God loves us in this way. And when we love like this, God calls it fruitfulness. We're called to be, not to do. How do we live this way? This is a hard 
I struggled with how to make an application here for us as, as we close now. Because it can easily turn into a list of do's and don'ts. How do we live this life with God? Oh, I need to start reading my Bible more. I need to start praying more. I need to start going to church more. But it's not a list of do's and don'ts, right? It's really, but it is more of developing habits in my life. That's true. It's not about performance before God, doing things. But it is about acting out of a heart that's committed to loving God, right? It is about rearranging the things in my life so that God can begin to prune me and clean me and produce this fruitfulness in me. It requires an openness and attentiveness to God. It requires time. It doesn't happen overnight. It requires investment in the relationship. But this is grace. This is the life of grace. Grace works in us as we work with grace and makes us do things that we never thought we could do and produce things in us, these fruits of love that we never thought would come out. Let's close in prayer. As I pray for you. Lord, we're so grateful to you for your unfailing love for us. We're so grateful that we don't have to figure everything out about this life we live in you, but that you show us, you teach us day by day that you reach out to us and love on us and fill us with your life and your grace and your joy and your peace as we just open ourselves to you. I pray, Lord, that we would respond to your word this morning. Pray, Lord, that whatever it is you're speaking to us specifically, we would respond to it. That you would do that deep work of grace and of love in our lives. Teach us to pray. Teach us how to live and walk with you, Lord, just where we're at. Give us freedom to do so, Lord. I just pray for each person that's here, Lord. And if there's somebody here that doesn't know you at all, that this would be the day they would experience your love and make a decision, Lord. They would acknowledge that they've been traveling through life, not experiencing real life, but that they would come to you and know real life. I thank you, Lord. I bless this congregation. I bless each person here that's uniquely made in your image that you have hardwired for relationship with, that they would enter that new life through Jesus, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you this morning. Thanks for being here. May you walk in the, in the, in the beauty and the love of Jesus this morning. Amen.